Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today, we have episode 369 for March 25th, 2024. And I have got a lot of stuff to cover today. we got a new show for you, but I've got other stuff to cover, too. And one big news item that I have been very excited about and something I can't wait to have, can't believe I've taken this long to do. Uh, I finally got another patron promotion going on. It's been way too long. I think it's been over a year, which <laughs> that's just dumb on my part. Just dumb. So anyway, uh, stay tuned after the news for details on that. Uh, also, I just was interviewed by uh, David Reese from Malwarebytes. Uh, on their Lock and Code podcast. Uh, this, I think, was my second or third appearance uh, on their show. Uh, that should be out now, uh, but I don't know the link yet because it came out late last night, which technically was after I have recorded what I'm saying right now. <laughs> so I don't have it yet, but I do have a link to their general uh, podcast page in the show notes, so you should be able to get it from there. It should be the most recent episode. That was a lot of fun. I love talking to David. We'll have to get him back on our show as well. Uh, he's He's always fun to talk to. By the way, in the podcast, we talked about uh, securing your home network, uh, basically kind of walking through the the four-part series of blog articles I wrote about how to lock down all your IoT devices and your router and such, uh, and we had a good discussion about that. Also, quick PSA, make sure you update your iPhones and iPads. There's uh, some sort of security fix. Apple's always kind of tight-lipped about what they are. There were some security fixes in there, so make sure you get your iPhones and iPads updated also, speaking of Apple, I, I I didn't do a news story about this, but I just and I honestly I'm still learning about exactly what's going on here. But I did want to mention that the U.S. Department of Justice, the DOJ, has filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, claiming that they have done some anti-competitive things. Uh, honestly, I think they probably have. Uh, as much as I enjoy Apple's products from a usability standpoint and their you know, focus on privacy, certainly relative to other companies, their business practices could be outright bad. And honestly, I, I hope that between the, the DOJ lawsuit and the EU, that Apple is going to open up its products some more and be a little less pushy about its own products and services. That is something that has bothered me for a while. So it does not surprise me that this lawsuit has been filed. Anyway, I can like Apple's products and still not like their behavior all the time. Uh, and so we'll, I'll be anxious to see what happens here. But hopefully in the end, what, what we end up having is more choice. Uh, I will probably still recommend for most people that they stay inside the Apple ecosystem. It probably will be safer. But I do believe we should have the right, uh, since we buy these products, to have more control over what they do. So we'll see how that goes. Also, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not. But Signal, which is the gold standard secure end-to-end -end messaging service that I always recommend, uh, has finally ditched the requirement for publishing your cell phone number as your Signal account ID. They still require you to have one, and there are some reasons that they do this, and, and this goes back to why they required them in the first place. It kind of cuts down on spammers and, and things like that. Um, you can read their view on that if you go to their blogs, and they will explain it. But from a privacy perspective, it's obviously not ideal that anybody that you want to talk to in Signal has to then get your real phone number. So anyway, they have finally implemented usernames, which are really just aliases. Uh, you can change it, I think, as often as you wish. Uh, all it really is is a way to connect with somebody. You can give me your username instead of your cell phone number, and then you can connect with somebody on Signal without having to give away your number. That's a good thing. So if you're interested, go to the signal.org website and you can find more information about that. Okay, so we have a news show for you today. First, we're going to talk about this AT&T breach where supposedly 73 million records have been released. It actually appears to be from an old leak, but it's coming back up. So we'll talk about that because it's hitting the news. Also hitting the news, you know, in kind of typical hyperbolic fashion is this completely unpatchable security flaw in all Apple Macs or all Apple Silicon Max, which is everything they've made in the last few years. It's real, but it's not very easy to exploit. So I'll kind of give you the lowdown on that. 404 Media keeps publishing great articles, but I'm going to talk about one in particular this week where they have found that a lot of very popular digital safe lock mechanisms have what they call secret backdoor codes. Their secret might be a little bit of a strong word there, but I'll explain what I mean when we get to that news article. Lifehacker has an article about why it's not safe to click on links in Twitter or X, and not just for the regular reasons that I've talked about before, but in this case, Twitter is actually doing something 
bad that other ones are not doing that I'm aware of. So I want to explain what's going on there. There was a rather disturbing court case recently that basically says that law enforcement can film your front porch for days on end without violating your privacy or needing a warrant. Searches for VPNs have spiked in Texas after Pornhub has pulled out of that state like it's pulled out of other states. The New York Times had a blockbuster article about car privacy and how it is how it has actually been used to raise people's insurance rates. And that just since in the two weeks since we've had a new show has led to all sorts of outcomes. And then finally, Airbnb has finally banned cameras from the inside, at least of their uh, rental properties. And we'll wrap it all up with a very short and somewhat bleak <laughs> quote unquote tip of the week. All right, lots to cover. Let's get to it. All right, first up, let's talk about this AT&T leak. And let me start by reading this article from Restore Privacy. A threat actor has leaked over 73 million records allegedly containing information on AT&T customers on the Breach hacking forums. AT&T is a multinational telecommunications service provider headquartered in downtown Dallas, Texas. It's the world's fourth largest telecom company by revenue and the largest wireless carrier in the United States. The database that was leaked today, which in the article is written March 17th, on the hacking forum is allegedly from the August 2021 breach we covered and was organized by the notorious data broker Shiny Hunters. As we noted in our original 2021 article, the threat actor claimed to have acquired it via data breach on the American telecom giant without disclosing many details about the actual cyber attack. The threat actor said they held sensitive information on 70 million uh, AT&T customers, offering it for sale for a million dollars. AT&T disputed the authenticity of the data via statement to restore privacy, while Shiny Hunters held firmly to its original claims during a discussion with us, even offering AT&T a negotiation opportunity. Today, another cyber criminal named Major Nelson has leaked what he claims to be a full copy of that data, which contains the following data points. Full names, email addresses, phone numbers, physical addresses, social security numbers, and dates of birth. Restore Privacy reviewed the leaked samples and found that they contain a mix of clear text and encrypted or hashed entries, so it looks like they are in raw form. Also, the complete data, which is accessible for a small amount of cryptocurrency to members of the hacking forum, appears to be authentic. As researcher VX Underground notes on X or Twitter, it is still being determined if that data comes from a third-party contractor or AT&T themselves, and in the latter case, which AT&T department. After further investigation, an AT&T spokesperson provided the following statement to restore privacy, denying the breach. And this is from AT&T. We have no indications of a compromise of our systems. We determined in 2021 that the information offered on this online forum did not appear to have come from our systems. This appears to be the same data set that has been recycled several times on this forum. In the meantime, AT&T customers are advised to remain vigilant and switch their two-factor authentication methods on valuable accounts to non-SMS or non not text-based, as this data leak increases the risk for unauthorized number ports, aka SIM swaps. The dangers of phishing and social engineering for exposed individuals are also elevated, so stay alert for suspicious communications. Okay, so this looks bad. Uh, if you're an AT&T customer, as I am actually, you probably want to know whether or not your information is part of this leak. And of course, my go-to reference for that is always Troy Hunt's very helpful site, haveibeenpwned.com. That's haveibeenpwned.com. And I've checked his site. Uh, he does now have the AT&T data there. So he has incorporated that into his search tool. So put in the email address that you have associated with your AT&T account, and it will tell you whether or not uh, it's part of that breach. Actually, it'll tell you whether it's part of any breach. I did check my email address. It doesn't appear that I was in the AT&T breach, but nevertheless, it's something that you might want to check out if you're an AT&T customer. I don't know if it's only AT&T cellular customers that were affected by this. For example, in the US, AT&T also offers internet service, fiber usually. I don't know if those customers were affected as well, but you could just find out for yourself by going to the Have I Been Pwned website and entering your email address. So the author of this article did say that you should avoid using SMS for your two-factor authentication. I've always said that. That is always true. Whether <laughs> I've said that way before this happened. SIM swapping or phone cloning or these techniques that allow bad guys to basically 
set up a phone that works just like yours and will get all of your calls and messages can use that to then get your two-factor authentication codes if those codes are sent to you by regular text message. So it it's better than nothing, but I would always recommend if you have the choice, don't use SMS-based two-factor authentication. Use the time-based one-time password applications, authenticator applications like you know, Google Authenticator or Authy or Aegis or some of these others. But what I will recommend you do that I did not see in this article is to set a security pin on your cellular phone account. And this is something you can do through the website or you could do, I think, in the store. It's sort of like two-factor authentication. It's just a second step to lock down your account. What it should mean is that any major changes to your account, like setting up a, a new phone or, or changing the security pin or doing some of these uh, administrative tasks on your account that might be harmful if a, a bad guy were to do it out from under you uh, would require them to know the security pin before those changes are, are made. I think there are ways still around that, but it's still better than nothing. So you, uh, if you have not done this already, and regardless of whether or not you're an AT&T customer, uh, if you've got a cell phone account like most of us do, at least in the U.S., I know you can set a security pin on your account, which makes it harder for bad guys to do this SIM swapping attack. All right, next up, this is from 9to5Mac. And there's been a lot of articles on this. I don't know if, how much it got into the mainstream news, but I saw lots of articles basically with headlines saying unpatchable security error in all modern Apple computers. While technically that is sort of true, it's not as bad as it sounds. So let me read this article, then I'll give you my take. University researchers have found an unpatchable security flaw in Apple Silicon Max, which would allow an attacker to break encryption and get access to cryptographic keys. The flaw is present in M1, M2, and M3 chips. Those are the Apple Silicon chips. And because the failing is part of the architecture of the chips, there's no way for Apple to fix it in current devices. The problem arises from a bug in the DMP, or Data Memory Dependent Prefetchers. Seven researchers from six different universities worked together to identify the vulnerability and create an app which was able to successfully exploit it. And they called it GoFetch. The details are pretty technical, which is an understatement. But the short version is that the data stored in the chip is sometimes mistaken for a memory address and cached. If a malicious app forces this error to occur repeatedly, then over time it can decrypt the key. It's not the first time that a DMP vulnerability has been found in Apple Silicon. Back in 2022, a different research team found one they named Augury. The researchers said that because the problem can't be patched, the best Apple could do is implement workarounds, but these would badly hurt performance. To exploit the vulnerability, an attacker would have to fool a user into installing a malicious app, and unsigned Mac apps are blocked by default. Additionally, the time taken to carry out an attack is quite significant, ranging from 54 minutes to 10 hours in tests carried out by the researchers, so the app would need to be running for a considerable time. Apple has so far chosen not to implement protection against the Augury DMP exploit, likely because the performance hit wouldn't be justified by the very low possibility of a real-world attack. The researchers here shared their findings with Apple back in December, and so far no workaround has been implemented, doubtless for the same reason. The company has not publicly commented. The long-term solution will be for Apple to address the vulnerability in the DMP implementation in the design of future chips. Okay, so... Yes, this is built into the hardware, into the actual brains of the computer, and therefore it's not something you can just fix with software, even though there are mitigations that Apple could put into place, which they may do, to make it harder to exploit this. And I assume in future hardware designs, they will probably try to address this. <laughs> so that means that if you've got a recent Mac, which I do, then you are potentially vulnerable to this. But again, the pay attention to what this article said. So first of all, you have to be infected by malware. So there's that. So Apple actually has some pretty decent built-in anti-malware protections, uh, including what this article referenced. It's got this thing called Gatekeeper that prevents you from running unsigned apps, at least easily. Uh, you can, as a user, override that and run them anyway. That pops up an error message. You can say, yes, I really do trust this app, run it anyway. Um, but it does get in the way. Um, so it, it's harder for this to actually happen. So first of all, you've got to have this malware on your on your machine in the first place. So you've already been compromised, basically. And once you've got malware running on your machine, there's a lot of other ways that that malware can, 
can get up to bad things without having to do this really crazy hardware hack. They could just do key logging, right? I mean, they could just look for you to enter passwords and social security numbers and credit card numbers and things. And once you've already got malware in your machine, you're, you're already in really rough shape. So, you know, this is honestly the least of your concerns. If I was a bad guy, I wouldn't be spending a whole lot of time doing this. But this might be something more for nation states or these uh, companies that are creating, you know, surveillance malware, you know, they might be using techniques like this. But at the end of the day, this is a hardware problem. And it's similar to the ones we I found in the Intel chips, and the AMD chips like um, uh, Spectre and Meltdown, they found tricky ways to exploit optimizations in the hardware that basically try to get ahead of the software that's running and say, I want to be ready for whatever comes my way. So I'm going to prefetch a lot of this information. I'm going to pre calculate a lot of things so that when the time comes and the software says, okay, well, if this happened, do this, but if this other thing happened, go this other direction. And I want to have both of those things ready to go. So that when that time happens, there's, there takes no time to keep moving these kind of hyper optimizations for performance purposes have had problems in the past, and this is just yet another one. So yes, it's true, it's in the hardware, so the hardware can't be changed after the fact uh, until you get a new Mac. Uh, it is hard to fix with software because basically it throws away all these optimizations, which makes certain operations much slower. And because you have to be affected with malware anyway, my guess is Apple's probably not gonna address this with anything too major. So I wouldn't worry about it that much, but I wanted you to be aware of it because it didn't make a lot of headlines. All right, next up, this is from 404 Media, and it's about uh, digital safe locks. Two of the biggest manufacturers of locks used in commercial safes have been accused of essentially putting back doors in at least some of their products in a new letter by Senator Ron Wyden. Wyden is urging the U.S. government to explicitly warn the public about the vulnerabilities, which Wyden says could be exploited by foreign adversaries to steal what U.S. businesses store in safes, such as trade secrets. The little-known manufacturer or manager reset codes could let third parties, such as spies or criminals, bypass locks without the owner's consent and are sometimes not disclosed to customers. Wyden's office also found that while the U.S. Department of Defense, the DOD, bans such locks for sensitive and classified U.S. government use, in part due to the security vulnerability that these reset codes pose, the government has deliberately not warned the public about the existence of these backdoors. The specific companies named in Wyden's letter are China-based Securam, uh, that's S-E-C-U-R-A-M, and U.S.-based Sargent and Greenleaf, or S&G. Each produces keypad locks that are then implemented into safes by other manufacturers. The full list of locks that contain backdoor codes is unknown, but the documentation available online points to multiple Securam products that do include them, and S&G confirmed to Wyden's office that some of its own locks have uh, also have similar codes. The findings produce clarity on sometimes hidden features inside widely popular physical locks. They also provide an analogy to the discussion around encryption backdoors. For decades, governments, tech companies, and members of civil society have clashed over multiple lobbying attempts by agencies to have backdoors inserted into technology, and in particular, encryption products. The fact that DOD protected its own interests while not warning the public gives a stark demonstration of what could happen if a backdoor was inserted into a consumer electronics device or similar. According to Securam's documentation available online, some of their locks include a manager code. This allows someone who isn't the end user to unlock the safe lock system, change the manager code, add or delete a user code, or enable or disable a user code, the documentation reads. The documentation also explicitly says that sometimes the existence of a manager code may not be sent to an actual user of the device. In fact, it says, quote, in some instances, the manager code and associated operating instructions are not issued to the end user, unquote, meaning that people may be using these locks without understanding that they can include a backdoor code. Unlocked codes entered the public consciousness recently, or at least those on the right, when the Liberty Safe, a gun lockbox company, provided the FBI with an access code to one of its safes in an investigation of someone who allegedly stormed the Capitol during January 6th. Okay, so you've likely seen these locks, these digital locks uh, uh, in a hotel safe. And when you go to a hotel and you open the cabinet and there's a safe in there that's got a little LED uh, this display on them and a little number pad and you can set your own code, you know, and lock your, your purse, your keys, your laptop, your 
you know, your iPad or whatever, you could lock them in there when you leave the room, set your code. When you come back, you enter your code and it opens the door. It's these kind of locks. Uh, and the way this article describes it is this company makes the lock part like, you know, and then they sell that to other companies that integrate that lock into other different kinds of safes. So it's a third party arrangement, but these companies have built in backdoor codes that will always work. Now I didn't read the whole article, but, uh, what the article seemed to imply is that the, the codes are actually different per lock and it's based on the serial number of the lock. So you could, if you had the serial number, you could call the manufacturer and say, here's the serial number what's the manager code. And they would give you the special code that would bypass any other code that was on that lock and open up that lock. So this actually probably shouldn't be a surprise, right? I mean, if you think like a hotel safe and you know, somebody puts something in there and they can't get it out, the manager is going to want to be able to open that, that safe in the hotel room for the occupant of that room without destroying the safe to do so. But the weird part about this article is that is that the company didn't always let the users buying these products know that this code existed. And that the US government, the Department of Defense, knew about these backdoor codes, banned them for use internally because of them, but did not release this information to the public. So really, that's the part to me that's most interesting about this story. And I think it's, uh, we hear Ron Wyden's name often on this show because he's doing a lot of great work in, pri in privacy and security. Uh, and another case where I, I agree, uh, this should not have been kept close to the vest. This should have been public. And I personally believe that it's in our all of our best interests for the U.S. government or law enforcement or whoever to be publishing vulnerabilities and sharing those vulnerabilities when they are found whenever and wherever they're found so they could be fixed. It helps all of us. And at the end of the day, I think that is the, the right call to make in almost all circumstances. If nothing else, we need to be informed consumers. These companies should be absolutely letting anybody know that uses these locks or through a third party and incorporates this lock into an end product uh, that these codes exist. All right, next up, this is an interesting article uh, from Lifehacker, something I was not aware of. Uh, and I want to make sure I bring it to your attention too. I think the kindest thing you can say about X, the social network formerly known as Twitter, in 2024 is that it's impressive that the site is actually still up and running. Sure, spam bots take over popular threads and hate speech is on the rise, and X is suing the company tracking it, by the way, and advertising is way down. But despite it all, Twitter.com still manages to load. But the reasons to bother loading the site at all continue to dwindle and fast, not just for the aforementioned reasons, because now it seems that it's not even safe to click links on X anymore. As noted by security researcher Will Dorman, some posts on X purport to lead to a legitimate website, but actually redirect somewhere else. In Dorman's example, an advertisement posted by a verified X user claims to lead to Forbes.com. When Dorman clicks the link, however, it takes him to a different link to open a Telegram channel that is, quote, helping individuals earn maximum profit in the crypto market, unquote. In short, the Forbes link leads to crypto spam. Bad actors can accomplish this thanks to the vulnerabilities in the way X handles URL previews or link previews. As Bleeping Computer explains, X checks the final destination of the URL rather than the initial link itself before generating a preview link on the site, which, you know, makes sense. That wouldn't be a problem if users actually are led to the final link destination every time. Unfortunately, this policy gives bad actors an opportunity to trick people into following links they never would have otherwise clicked on. All they have to do is set up two different URL destinations in their post. In the case outlined above, clicking the Forbes.com link actually takes you to joinchannelnow.net. Once on this site, the server checks to see whether the request is coming from a typical browser, that would be you. If so, it will take you to the spam site, which for this situation is a crypto scam telegram channel. However, if the server detects that the request is coming from something else, like the X or Twitter link verifying bot, it'll assume the request is not being made by a human. In these cases, it returns a legitimate URL. So even though the first link is to join channel now, X checks it and is taken to Forbes.com and so places that URL preview on the post. Your experience will be different. In short, this is a security nightmare. It means that every link you see on X could potentially lead to a site trying to spam you at best and scam you, install malware on your machine or otherwise take advantage of you at worst, all because you trusted a social media platform to show the proper preview for a link. 
The best way to stay safe on X is to stop using X. Seriously, how many final straws are necessary before we all realize the place isn't worth visiting anymore? The spicy memes no longer justify the many, many flaws and risks. Of course, many of us will keep using it anyway. Can't say I'm not still there. So having some actionable steps to take will help. So when using X on a computer, always hover your cursor over the link preview before clicking it. Because you're using a web browser, you'll be able to see the final link destination appear as a pop-up link preview, so you'll know whether a link is legit or not. If you see something other than the link that the post claims to be, don't click it. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to do this on mobile. So honestly, it's probably not worth opening links on X on your phone. I'd like to say you should only open links from accounts you trust, but since anyone who pays for X can now get a verification badge, it's way too easy to be tricked by an account claiming to have authority it doesn't. Remember, the account that posted the fake four links was verified too. Okay, so this is actually taking a little beyond what we've seen on social media up to this point. A lot of social media links will show you what looks to be, you know, uh, the actual URL, HTTP or HTTPS colon slash slash Forbes.com or whatever it is, and some long link to this article this person is supposedly posting on this, you know, tweet or whatever. Under the covers, if you actually right click on that link and say copy link, and then put that in a text editor somewhere, you'll see that like in Twitter's case, the link is not what it shows you. The link is actually t.co slash and then some gibberish because Twitter actually makes that link a Twitter link first because it wants to collect analytics on you, about you, about your browser, as much as it can learn about you when you click on that link uh, before sending you to the actual destination. So that's been around for a while, and I've talked about that on the show before, and uh, I've written blog articles about it. QR codes are kind of the same thing. It, it, they can hide the ultimate destination, but this is even worse than that. What's going on here is that <laughs> the person who posted this link actually had the website that responded to this link set up such that it acts differently depending on the user agent and whatever other information it can glean from the uh, the, the person checking the link or the, in this case, the bot or the automated service checking the link to determine who that is. And it does different things depending on who clicked that link. So in Twitter's case, Twitter has some automated bot that, that checks all these links to go and fetch a preview of the website to post there. So you can see what the site is going to kind of look like supposedly when you go there, but the, <laughs> But the scammers figured out a way to show one thing to the Twitter bot and a different thing to you. So that when you click on that link, you actually go to this scam site. So what the heck can you do about this? Well, as the article says, it's really, really hard to, you know, to, to properly preview links on a mobile browser. Like you don't have the hover mechanism really uh, on, a, on a mobile browser like you would on uh, with a mouse on a computer browser. And he is right. I checked this. If you go to Twitter... Uh, if there's a link, like you actually see in the tweet, like the text of the link, uh, HTTPS colon slash slash Forbes.com or whatever, if you hover your mouse over that, it will think a second and then it will just below that show you the link that it believes it will eventually take you to. In most cases, they should be the same. The link that Twitter is showing you, even though it's not what the real link is, because again, there's this t.co link in, in the in, in between that's going to redirect you. But it, if you hover over a, a link that's shown there, they, they should agree. And if they don't, you absolutely should not click on it. But what I did notice is that there are several times when uh, uh, you link to an article and it doesn't actually print the link in the text of the tweet. Uh, it just shows you a preview. And that preview, if you hover over that, doesn't tell you anything. So even on a computer browser, this is not straightforward. Uh, now, there are link expanding services, which again is really not possible to use, or at least not easy to use on a, on a mobile app or a mobile browser, but on a computer, you can right click, get the URL. And again, in this case, it's going to start with a t.co uh, URL for Twitter and LinkedIn does this. Facebook does this. They all do this. Um, they, they redirect through them first. Google does it. They redirect through them. And so they can get some information about you and then take you to the destination. Like you can through services like unshorten.it or wheregoes.com. And there are others. If you uh, just do a, a web search for uh, URL expanders or URL unshortening services or things like that, uh, these websites and uh, almost all do the same thing. You put in the link of where you want to go. They will go check that link for you, see where it eventually ends up, and then tell you what the final link is. In some cases, it will actually take a screenshot 
of that web page and show you what the web page is going to look like too. So, you know, it's a real pain in the butt, but if you really, really want to click that link and you're not sure, that is something you could do to, to try to test it first. Personally, I this has become such an issue that I think we need operating system level support for link checking. And so this should work on any link you click on, whether or not it's in your browser of choice, whether it's the browser that comes with the device, or whether it's the application you're running, because a lot of apps, especially mobile apps now, have built-in web browsers that are used when you click on links in that app that don't take you to your default or chosen web browser. It, it uses a web browser that they've bundled with the app. But I think at this point, this has become such a problem that we probably need an operating level system call here that, that allows you to, as a user, or certainly as the operating system, insert some sort of security checking on any link clicked before it is followed. All right, let's move on. Next one is from Gizmodo. And this is a rather troubling court decision that uh, I'm hoping will be appealed further and, and change. But uh, for the meantime, it's, it's not good. Law enforcement in Kansas recorded the front of a man's home for 68 days straight, 15 hours a day, and obtained evidence to prove him guilty on 16 charges. The officers did not have a search warrant, using a camera on a pole positioned across the street to capture Bruce Hayes' home. A federal court ruled on Tuesday, and I think this was last Tuesday, that it was fine for law enforcement to do so in what's potentially a major reduction in privacy law. And this is a quote from the U.S. 10th Circuit Court of Appeals in this decision. It says, quote, Mr. Hay had no reasonable expectation of privacy in a view of the front of his house. As video cameras proliferate throughout society, regrettably, the reasonable expectation of privacy from filming is diminished, unquote. Hay, an Army veteran, was found guilty of lying about his disability status to collect benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs. However, the concerning part of this case stems from how VA officers collected evidence against Hay. The veteran appealed his case, arguing that the months-long surveillance of his home crossed a line. However, the federal court ruled that law enforcement can videotape the outside of your home, partially because of how prominent video cameras have become in society. The federal court's decision says that the video cameras have become ubiquitous and have therefore diminished our expectations of privacy. Police officers wear body cameras now, cell phones have cameras, and many doorbells record your porch. The court isn't wrong that cameras are everywhere. However, law enforcement has a long history of blurring the lines of privacy with modern recording technology. Invasive searches of private property typically require law enforcement to obtain a search warrant. In this case, VA officers or Veterans Affairs officers received a tip that Hay was not actually disabled, so they went ahead with recording his house without acquiring a warrant. The court argued that, that was okay because anyone walking by Hay's house could see what the camera saw. However, most people walking past your house are not sitting there for two months straight. Recording the outside of your home for months on end can paint a pretty intimate picture of your life. Hay argued that this allowed law enforcement to learn his habits and understand when he entered and exited his home and who came into his house. U.S. versus Hay sets a precedent around how cameras can be used by law enforcement. It clearly defines what federal agents can record and also what is considered a reasonable expectation of privacy. According to this case, the front of your home is not private at all. So again, I this is was not at the Supreme Court level. I hope it is appealed up to the Supreme Court and they change this. I think we need to somehow make a distinction about the capabilities that technology brings to bear uh, on our right to privacy because they are capable of doing things that humans are not. And I think we have to make that distinction somehow. All right, next up, this is from CNN. Searches for virtual private networking or VPN software briefly spiked in Texas this week, which I think last week or the week before, after Pornhub suspended service in the state over a law forcing adult websites to verify the age or identities of their users. The fourfold rise in Google searches for tools that can circumvent the state-level blocking suggests the law may already be having unintended side effects days after a federal appeals court upheld the legislation and said it could remain in effect. Visitors with Texas IP addresses, and that's key, not from Texas, but with Texas IP addresses, who visit Pornhub's website are now presented with a full-page message calling the Texas law ineffective, haphazard, and dangerous. Search interest in VPNs began disproportionately rising in Texas Thursday compared to the rest of the country, according to the CNN analysis of Google Trends data, 
quadrupling in the hours following Pornhub's announcement before retreating slightly by early Friday morning. While Google Trends merely shows correlations between the events and is only useful as a gauge of relative search interest for a given snapshot of time, the immediacy of the search spike, coupled with its concentration from within Texas, highlights the potential connection between the law and Pornhub's users. And this is a quote from Evan Greer for Fight for the Future, somebody I'd love to have on the show, by the way. Quote, a link seems pretty likely. The apparent spike in VPN searches in Texas shows that these type of age verification laws aren't just unconstitutional, they're also silly and ineffective. Just like millions of people in countries like China, Russia, and Turkey evade their government's draconian online censorship regimes using simple tools like VPNs, we now see Texans doing the same to get around their own state's invasive rules, unquote. Pornhub has pulled out of multiple states in response to a wave of age verification laws sweeping the country, including Montana, Utah, Virginia, and others. It also highlights the running debate in the state houses nationwide about how and whether governments can require websites to perform age verification. The law in Texas requires adult websites to implement reasonable age verification methods to ensure that pornography is not being distributed to minors. Those methods include either requiring users to submit proof of identity, such as a government-issued ID to the adult website or to a third-party contractor, or by submitting other personal data to a third-party contractor, such as biometric information that enables the vendor to check a user's age. Pornhub said in a blog post that it supports age verification, but that forcing individual websites and third-party providers to handle users' most sensitive personal information creates unreasonable privacy and security risks. Pornhub has proposed and reiterated on Thursday that age verification checks should be performed exclusively on a user's device without requiring them to send data over the internet to third parties. So you've been seeing this in the news, I'm guessing. Um, this has been popping up a lot in various ways and the other way being uh, the kids online safety act. And I will talk about that in depth when I um, air my interview with Joe Mullen from the EFF, which will be coming up soon. But this is a case of trying to solve a problem in a way that causes more problems than it's worth. They've tried to do this in other countries as well. I know in the UK and Australia, age verification is a really dicey thing. In the end, honestly, a lot of these states, at least in the US, they don't care if Pornhub is there or not. In fact, they're actually happy that this law has caused Pornhub to leave the state. But it's legal content here in the US, at least if you're over a certain age. So really what they're doing is they end up censoring this, this, this material from law-abiding citizens doing law-abiding things. Because how many people are actually going to submit a driver's license copy or a passport copy to Pornhub or some third party acting on Pornhub's behalf to verify your age in order to access porn? So what Pornhub is, is talking about here, and which I've mentioned before, is there are possible ways that we could implement this age verification that don't have privacy implications. For example, if Apple and Google were to build in an age verification system into their products in general, which could be optional, but something you could opt into, where upon challenging, you could prove that you are at least 18 years old or 21, whatever the magic number is, you could prove that you're at least that old without actually giving away your true age, let alone your identity. And this would be a third party verification like they're talking about, but wouldn't have the privacy implications. Now, there are still other problems with this. Uh, again, when we talk to uh, Joe Mullen, uh, you know, there are situations you might not be thinking about where restricting access to some of this content, I'm not talking about porn in particular, but some of this quote unquote adult content actually can help minors in certain situations. So we'll get into that when we talk with Joe Mellon. But for now, I just wanted you to be aware of this is going on. <laughs> and I just thought it was funny that that shortly after this went into effect, the searches for VPN software spiked in Texas. All right, next up is a really a series of articles from the New York Times, I think all written by Kashmir Hill, who we had on the show last fall. Fantastic articles about privacy in cars or lack thereof. Uh, and obviously something, if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know, this is something I've been talking about for a long time. We've interviewed uh, Andrea Miko from Privacy for Cars. We've inter interviewed Jen Kaltreiter from Mozilla's Privacy Not Included group, who is actually quoted in this article I'm about to read. And this is a really big deal. This is, <laughs> this is a real problem, a very serious privacy problem. And uh, it, 
it has me shaking my head because I've known about this for some time and I've been talking about it for a long time and other people have as well. And it just seems like this, this should be known already. Like this, this should have already gotten out there. Our, certainly our congressional representatives should be well aware of this at this point. Nevertheless, the New York Times, a really popular paper from a very well-respected journalist, Kashmir Hill, made a huge difference. And just in the time that it took for this article to come out, since my last news show two weeks ago, a lot has already happened. So let me read uh, a snippet from the original article, and then I'll tell you what some of the knock-on effects have been from this being released. Ken Dahl, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's an odd name. I feel sorry for the guy. Uh, Ken Dahl, like, you know, like Barbie doll, Ken Dahl, his name is spelled K-E-N-N-D-A-H-L, but I assume it's pronounced Ken Dahl. Ken Dahl says he's always been a careful driver. The owner of a software company near Seattle, he drives a leased Chevrolet Bolt. He's never been responsible for an accident. So Mr. Dahl, 65, was surprised in 2022 when the cost of his car insurance jumped 21%. Quotes from other insurance companies were also high. One insurance agent told him his LexisNexis report was a factor. LexisNexis is a New York-based global data broker with a risk solutions division that caters to the auto industry and has traditionally kept tabs on car accidents and tickets. Upon Mr. Dahl's request, LexisNexis sent him a 258-page consumer disclosure report which it must provide per the Fair Credit Reporting Act. What it contained stunned him. More than 130 pages detailing each time he or his wife had driven the Bolt over the previous six months. It included the dates of 640 trips, their start and end times, the distance driven, and an accounting of any speeding, hard braking, or sharp accelerations. The only thing it didn't have is where they had driven the car. According to the report, the trip details had been provided by General Motors, the manufacturer of the Chevy Bolt, and then LexisNexis analyzed that driving data to create a risk score, quote, for insurers to use as one factor of many to create more personalized insurance coverage, unquote, according to a LexisNexis spokesperson. Eight insurance companies had requested information about Mr. Dahl from LexisNexis over the previous month. And this is a quote from Dahl. He says, quote, it felt like a betrayal. They're taking information that I didn't realize was going to be shared and screwing with our insurance, unquote. In recent years, insurance companies have offered incentives to people who install dongles in their car or download smartphone apps that monitor their driving, including how much they drive, how fast they take corners, how hard they hit the brakes, and whether they speed. But, and this is a quote from Ford uh, Motor Company, says, quote, But drivers are historically reluctant to participate in these programs, unquote. And in this Ford patent application, it describes that what is happening is instead, car companies are collecting information directly from internet-connected vehicles for use by the insurance industry. Sometimes this is happening with the driver's awareness and consent. Car companies have established relationships with insurance companies so that if drivers want to sign up for what's called usage-based insurance, where rates are set based on monitoring of their driving habits, it's easy to collect that data wirelessly from their cars. But in other instances, something much sneakier has happened. Modern cars are internet-enabled, allowing access to services like navigation, roadside assistance, and car apps that drivers can connect to their vehicles to locate them or unlock them remotely. In recent years, automakers, including GM, Honda, Kia, and Hyundai, have started offering optional features in their connected car apps that rate people's driving. Some drivers may not realize that, if they turn on these features, the car companies then give information about how they drive to data brokers like LexisNexis. Automakers and data brokers that have partnered to collect detailed driving data from millions of Americans say they have driver's permission to do so. But the existence of these partnerships is nearly invisible to drivers whose consent is obtained in fine print and murky privacy policies that few read. Especially troubling is that some drivers with vehicles made by GM say they were tracked even when they did not turn on the feature, called OnStar Smart Driver, and that their insurance rates went up as a result. Even for those who opt in, the risks are far from clear. I have a GM car, a Chevrolet. I went through the enrollment process for Smart Driver. There was no warning or prominent disclosure that any third party would get access to my driving data. Jim Kaltreiter, a, re a researcher at Mozilla who reviewed the privacy policies for more than 25 car brands last year, said that drivers have little idea about what they are consenting to when it comes to co data collection. She says it is impossible for consumers to try and understand the legalese-filled policies for car companies, their connected services, and their apps. 
she called cars a privacy nightmare. And then another quote from uh, Caltrider, quote, the car companies are really good at trying to link these features to safety and say they are all about safety. They're about making money, unquote. General Motors is not the only automaker sharing driving behavior. Kia, Subaru, and Mitsubishi also contribute to the LexisNexis Telematics Exchange, a portal for sharing consumer-approved connected car data with insurers. As of 2022, the exchange, according to a LexisNexis news release, has real-world driving behavior collected from over 10 million vehicles. Verisk, that's V-E-R-I-S-K, also claims to have access to data from millions of vehicles in partnerships with major automakers, including Ford, Honda, and Hyundai. Two of these automakers said that they were not sharing data or only limited data. Subaru shares odometer data with LexisNexis for Subaru customers who turn on Starlink and authorize that data to be shared when shopping for auto insurance, said a spokesperson. And then Ford, quote, does not transmit any connected vehicle data to either partner, unquote, said a spokesperson, Alan Hall, but partnered with them to explore ways to support customers who want to take part in usage-based insurance programs. Ford will share driving behavior from a car directly with an insurance company, he said, when a customer gives explicit consent via an in-vehicle touchscreen. The other automakers all have optional driver coaching features in their apps. Kia, Mitsubishi, and Hyundai have driving score, while Honda and Acura have driver feedback that, when turned on, collect information about people's mileage, speed, braking, and acceleration that is then shared with LexisNexis or Verisk, the company said in response to questions from the New York Times. But that would not be evident or obvious to drivers using these features. In fact, before a Honda owner activates driver feedback, a screen titled Respect for Your Privacy assures drivers that your data will never be shared without your consent. But it is shared with Verisk, a fact disclosed in a more than 2,000 word terms and conditions screen that a driver needs to click accept on. Honda does mention Verisk in a FAQ or an FAQ on its website, and Kia highlights its relationship with LexisNexis Risk Solutions on its website. A Kia spokesperson said LexisNexis can't share driving score data of Kia participants with insurers without additional consent. Drivers who have realized what is happening are not happy. The Palm Beach Cadillac owner said he would never buy another car from GM, and he is planning to sell his Cadillac. Okay, this was actually a much longer article. If this <laughs> angers you as much as it did me, I would recommend that you read the whole thing because it's very informative. But there have been two follow-ups just since that article uh, went out. First of all, the guy that this article mentioned filed a lawsuit against GM and is seeking class action status. And then shortly after that, just last Friday, GM announced that it has stopped sharing driving data with LexisNexis and Verisk. So that one article has caused a huge uproar, and it's about damn time. <laughs> oh, this, this has been really bad. I, so hopefully it's going to go further than this. I really hope this raises a massive stink and a lot of awareness. Uh, I'll be very interested to see what comes of this. But I'm, I'm very, very happy to see that this is finally getting some much-needed attention. All right, one more real quick, uh, and this is a welcome development, some, some rare good news this week. Airbnb continues its redemption tour with the announcement today that it is banning all indoor security cameras in Airbnb properties starting April 30th, 2024. As an extra kick, the news offered more detailed guidance on outdoor cameras as well. Today's policy change was a simple, literal ban on cameras in any space defined as indoor, full stop. Outside, cameras are, quote, not allowed in certain outdoor areas where there's a greater expectation of privacy, like an enclosed outdoor shower or sauna, unquote. I suspect the fuzziness of definitions here will continue to be an issue since most guests, such as myself, have an expectation of privacy anytime and anywhere I've paid for the privilege, including backyards and patios. Video doorbells and noise monitors appear to have still gotten the green light. For some time, Airbnb has been lax about allowing cameras outdoors wherever hosts wanted to plant them, and indoors, so long as they remained in common areas. Hosts were required to disclose the camera's existence and locations, but with little enforcement from Airbnb, review sites flooded with reports of undisclosed cameras. For the host, these measures, which can also include smart home noise monitors like Minute and Nest, can help ensure that guests are respecting the property and the neighbors by not stealing or engaging in parties or other disturbing behavior. 
For guests, it's an invasion of privacy. This doesn't even take into account the privacy issues of those smart cameras being hacked and then seen by people other than the host, an issue that does appear to happen over and over. While Airbnb claims only a portion of hosts utilize indoor cameras, I suspect this is merely the number of reported cameras. Actual usage may be much higher. Today's policy clarity, if heeded, will create a more guest-friendly environment, but only if enforced. Airbnb stated, quote, Reported violations of this policy brought to our attention will be investigated, and action we can take include listing or account removal, unquote. So I've talked about this before on the show. Uh, it's a really creepy thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't expect hotels and motels to do this. And somehow it was okay for homeowners to do this uh, when they're renting out their homes for, you know, an, an Airbnb or whatever. Uh, so I'm happy to see this. And I just hope that it is very, very strictly and harshly enforced. Okay, so now it's time for my tip of the week. And it actually is, <laughs> it's not not so much of a tip of the week. It's kind of a public service announcement. But I do have a, a, a couple things you could try to do. Uh, and this is something I've been thinking about for some time. And actually, Steve Gibson prompted me to finally write about it. Because he's been talking about it a lot lately, too. So kind of read my mind or something. I don't know. But we talk so much on this show about, you know, strong uh, account security. Passwords, pass keys, two-factor authentication. And, uh, you know, I harp on these things all the time. But... What I don't talk about often enough, and what I want to draw attention to now, I want to, and again, as usual, this is in my blog article for the week. Uh, my newsletter subscribers have already gotten this. Uh, and that really is that account security is, is kind of broken. And it's <laughs> the problem is the weak link. Like any security situation, your security is dependent on the weakest link in, in the chain. And today, because people are people, and because companies don't want to be handling a lot of support calls over you know, account access, there are backup methods, there are re recovery options for getting into your account if you don't have the password to get in or the passkey to get in or whatever. If, if you go to any website that has a login, right under the login, there's a little link that says, forgot your password, which anybody can click on, doesn't have to be you, right? It could be a bad guy. And what happens when you click on that link? Well, in most cases, what happens is, is you'll get an email to the registered email address for that account with a special one-time link that lets you log in and probably reset your password. In fact, apparently it's a thing where people like don't even bother remembering their passwords anymore. They set it to something and instead of trying to remember that password or write it down or use a password manager, they just always click that link, forgot my password and just reset it every time. I mean, it works, it gets you into the account. It's a little, takes a little bit longer to do, but then you don't have this pesky password to remember. Well, the problem is that that what this all means is that all of your accounts, because most people only have one email address, maybe two, but all of your accounts, no matter how good your passwords are and whether we have two factor authentication set up or all these things are all subverted by the security of that email account. If I can get access to your email account, then I can go to these websites where I know you have accounts and click, Hey, I forgot my password. I will get that email with the link that, that lets me reset the password or log in. And now I'm into those accounts. So obviously you're, you're thinking, well, Carrie, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to protect my email account, which you should, with a really strong password and two-factor authentication so that that can't happen. But it's still a re serious reduction in the security of your overall thing, right? I mean, because that one account now means that I can get into all your other accounts, regardless of the fact that they all have unique, strong passwords. But it actually gets worse than that. And, that's, and the one I really want to drive home today is some of these accounts still have the answer three magic questions recovery option. When you go to set up the account, you, you set a password or whatever, but then it says, okay, well, let's have some recovery questions in case you forget that password. Uh, and then, you know, what's your mother, what's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? What was your first elementary school? Where did you have your first kiss? You know, where were you married? Right? Anybody who knows you probably knows the answers to some of those questions, but it's worse than that because <laughs> a lot of people just share this publicly on their social media accounts. If they follow you on Facebook or something, they might be able to know or guess the answers to some of these recovery questions, meaning your super long, crazy, random, you know, generated password for that site is, is pointless. And I will even say that this kind of undermines the whole notion of pass keys, which are really great security things. I, I think in some aspects, potentially better than a strong random password plus two factor authentication. But I guarantee you that if when you go to these sites that you already have accounts on and say, hey, I want to set up a passkey and you set up a passkey, they don't then remove your password. So your old password is still there as a mechanism to log in. So if you consider passkeys as more secure than passwords, 
the effective overall security of your account is still as low as that password is, or as low as a recovery link or security questions. So what can you do about this? My tip of the week. The main thing is, is be aware of this. Uh, second, if you start using better security, see if you can disable these weaker recovery mechanisms. And finally, and this is something you may not have thought about, and I covered this in my book, if you are required to have these security questions, and these are answers that you can uh, fill in any way you want, you don't have to give the real answers. You can just lie, right? I mean, the only thing you need to be able to do is to reproduce those answers later. They don't have to be the correct answers. So you could actually even develop a, a method for doing this. Like, let's say the, the question is, is what's your mother's maiden name? And your mother's maiden name is Parker. Well, instead of putting Parker for the answer, you could put not Parker. Or you could do something like P -P -P Parker, where you repeat the first letter of the answer two or three times. Anybody who actually knew the answer to that question would answer Parker. They're not going to answer this other weird thing. And so therefore, they will get the, they will get the answer wrong because it doesn't match. The only thing I would recommend is if you, if you do do this, if you, if you can come up with some technique, you can always remember and always apply, fine, just keep it in your head. Um, but if you want to lie and come up with weird ways to lie, then I would recommend that in, the, in your password manager, because you're using one, right? In your password manager for that account, there should be a little notes section where you could write whatever you want. And I would write the questions that were asked and the answers that you gave so that uh, at any point in the future, you can always regurgitate the lies you told when you answered those questions. So there you have it. There is your news and your tip of the week, such as it is. All right, so here's the deal on the patron promotion. It's just been way too long since I've done a new patron promotion. I think it's been over a year. That's that's just too long. I need I need to do this on a more regular basis. Uh, but I'm going to address that to some extent today. So I'm starting a new promotion. This will have two parts to it. It will have a short-term part that will run through the end of April. Uh, and that is going to be the Dragon Challenge Coin part of the promotion. And then I, I've decided to make this an ongoing thing. I want to have this be something that I can give to my patrons, hopefully in perpetuity, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. But I specifically want to reward patrons who sign up for an annual membership. Partially that's because in order for these things to make financial sense to me, then it, it needs to be a, a long-term commitment. But I'm also constantly trying to come up with ways for adding value for my, for my patrons. I mean, I think I've already got some great stuff already. I mean, if you're a member, you get access to bonus content, either bonus Q&A with my interview guests, or if you're at a high enough level, you actually get access to uh, an ongoing series that I call Merlin's Musings, which is where I dig into some more technical stuff and some more personal stuff. You also get access to our Discord server, which is a great way to talk to me directly in real time, and also to other patrons and to share information there. If you're interested in learning some more about uh, security and privacy, we've got an InfoSec book club that I run as well. And you will also get uh, often previews of upcoming shows and interviews that I'm doing. Those are the kind of features that I currently have already for my patrons. But I've been thinking a lot about this lately, and I thought it would be cool if I could find some way to kind of uh, bring together my patrons with some of the products and services that I often recommend. Uh, and that includes Proton, uh, which includes Proton Mail and Proton VPN and Calendar and Drive and a lot of great features they have now. Uh, malware bytes. Uh, I don't often recommend antivirus software, but when I do, uh, they're usually at the top of my list. And uh, Safing, who makes Portmaster, which is a really cool outbound firewall product. And at least two of, the, of those three cases, I've actually, I know the founder and or CEO of the company. And I like what they're doing, right? I wouldn't bother doing this. So I reached out to all three of them and they have all graciously agreed to offer to my patrons basically what amounts to a one year trial or one year free service with their products. And this ranges in value from 40 to 50 bucks. And I've gotten 15 codes from each of them. So that's a total of 45 prizes, I guess we can call them or, or trials, free gift codes that, uh, that I'm putting in what I'm calling the treasure chest. But then on top of that, I, I've got these really great challenge coins that I created. I minted my, my first set of these, a hundred of these, uh, I think three or four years ago now. If you haven't seen these yet, check out the promo link that I'm going to give you in a minute. You can see what they look like. They're really cool. And they're like two inches in diameter. They're almost two ounces in weight, like, like 52 grams or so. They're, they're hefty. They're really beautiful. It's got this, on the front, there's this massive dragon looming over a castle with its drawbridge down. 
And on the back is my logo and my catchphrase, don't get caught with your drawbridge down is on the back. But if you look at it closely, you'll notice on the back that there's this weird kind of little nub in, in the middle of the back of the coin. And then if you flip it over on the front, you'll see along the edge uh, on the outside of the front of the coin are the numbers one through 20 in kind of a random order. And so what that is, is it's actually a, a die, a D20 die, uh, something you can spin on a table and stop with your finger to, to, to pick your die roll. And it's like a, like in Dungeons and Dragons, when you're playing with D20 die and you, it's almost always the most common dice roll in, in Dungeons and Dragons is to roll a D20 uh, to see what happens. So uh, what I've done uh, is I've actually taken that concept of the D20 die along with the concept of diceware, which is creating passphrases by rolling, uh, in most cases until now, you know, kind of standard six-sided dice. I've created a whole website for this called d20key.com, d20key.com, where you can create random passphrases by rolling d20 dice. Uh, and you can either roll the virtual dice there on the website, or you can roll your own and enter your numbers uh, to create your passphrase. And so <laughs> this website, along with this coin, can be used to generate secure passphrases. So that's why this challenge coin is, you know, I call it is security enhancing. But it's also just, <laughs> it's really cool looking. And like most challenge coins, if you ever meet me in person, like, I don't know, say at DEF CON in Las Vegas, if you produce your coin, if you show me your, your challenge coin, I'll buy you a drink. We'll have a drink together. Okay, so here, here are the details of the, of the promotion. So first of all, these are for annual subscribers uh, on Patreon. So you need to sign up for, for a whole year. And you need to sign up at one of the, the, higher of, the higher two levels of my patronage. And if you do, you will, first of all, if you do it before the end of April, and you live in the United States, I'll come back to that in a minute, I will send you one of these dragon coins. And they come in either gold, silver, or copper color finishes. If you sign up at the highest level, I will do my best to send it internationally. It's very expensive. It's very much of a pain in the butt to do. But certainly if you're, you know, if you're like in U.S., Canada, U.K., EU, probably Mexico, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. If you sign up at the highest level, I will try to send you one internationally. If that's make or break for you, uh, reach out to me by email first and let's talk about it. But certainly if you're in the United States, I will send one. If you sign up at one of the higher two patron levels for a year, you will get a coin and I'll probably throw in some stickers and stuff too. So there's that. But also if you are a new patron or an existing patron back to, let's say December, December of last year. So if you sign up for an annual membership, uh, anytime in that time, you will also be able to pick one of these three free trials out of the virtual treasure chest. And that should give you a free uh, year subscription to their products. And again, that's Proton, Malwarebytes and Portmaster for a value of about between 40 and 50 bucks, depending on which one you pick. So there's more details to this. You can see great pictures of the coins and, and get more details about the, uh, the trials. Uh, go to fdsd.me slash promo 424. And that's four for April and 24 for the year 2024. So fdsd.me slash promo 424. Again, the coin part of this will be running through the end of April. If you have not already gotten one, these things are really neat. I'm really glad I, I, I minted these coins. They're very cool. There's only 100 of these things currently on the entire planet. I guess 200 if you include the version one uh, of these coins. So they are highly collectible, highly sought after, uh, and just really cool. And hey, if you're into Dungeons & Dragons, <laughs> it'll be a fun way for you to roll your D20 dice. Thank you for listening. Take care, everybody. Got some great interviews on the way. I did manage to interview Dina Temple Raston from uh, NPR and the Click Here podcast. That was the big get I was hoping to lock in. That did happen last week. Now, it might not air for a while, but uh, that was a great interview. We talk about um, the cyber war in Ukraine. I also interviewed Seth for privacy about uh, CBDCs, which is central bank digital currency. We'll get to talk about crypto. And again, that'll, that'll be a little bit further out, but that is coming up. That is now in the can. Uh, you will get that uh, down the line. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do that and then you won't miss them. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Check out that promo, fdsd.me slash promo 424. And hopefully we'll get some new patrons. I look forward to interacting with you guys on Discord. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Bye.